And now, live from Level 5 Productions on the island of Milleronia, it's The Larry Miller Show! Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, and everyone who will never forget a date which will live in infamy. Hi, folks, and welcome back to The Larry Miller Show. I'm Larry Miller, but in a way, aren't we all? And boy, oh boy, is it beautiful here on Milleronia today. I know I've mentioned this before that, yes, I control the weather, but it's still worth saying how well I do it. How beautiful it is. Gee, it really is. It's a great island. I, I, I'm glad I picked this. I'm glad I constructed it so fully. I'm, I, I, I'm glad I made it with the designs that I really like. And, uh, well, and someone designed it uh, for me, of course, and a really top designer. And uh, then we had an argument, and he went to a volcano. Yes, we had an argument, and he... He ended his business time with me in Volcano Number 1. And, in fact, it went so poorly between him and me that uh, that's when I first decided to create Volcano Number 2. As you know, I've mentioned, by the way, we now have Volcano Number 3, but I can't. it's not finished yet, so I can't exactly tell you what's wrong with it or why. Well, you wouldn't like it at all. But in any case, boy, oh boy, I love Milleronia, and I love the way it's made. And yes, that music always makes me happy, always makes me feel great, better than I felt before it played. And of course, that's the Michael Delegati Orchestra and the Donna Reed Dancers, featuring boy tenor Mike Lucking, asking the musical question, Am I the best person to tell my children about sex? Well, I don't know, Mike, but I'm not doing it. I can guarantee you that. And Colonel Jeff agrees, by the way. He's not going to do it either. We're not jumping into that pond. I know you weren't asking us technically, but I'm just (laughs) cutting that off too sweet. How old are they, by the way? Whatever they uh, are, I'm sure they're nice, healthy kids. uh, But how old are they? Girl children, about 18, 20, really, really pretty, and they both need a bad social experience? Technically, Colonel Jeff and I would qualify for that. But uh, you know what? No, that's your job. That's the daddy's job. You know, besides, who else is going to do it? You know, it's a since you don't want the junior high health teacher doing it, come on, let's be honest. He's got to be crazy. And uh, not bad crazy, by the way. I loved my, uh, my uh, health teacher in, uh, what was that, I guess ninth grade or so? Mr. May, Herbie May, in uh, in our high school, and uh, he was a great guy. He also, he was funny and uh, tough, too, a football coach and big guy, and <laughs> you didn't want to mess with him. We used to call him the Bull from Indiana, and because uh, that's where he, he went to college, and that's where he played football, and uh, in fact, we, we had a lot of fun in that class. Once the... Uh, the he always took the boys outside into the hallway when one of us misbehaved and you know he put <laughs> lean you against a locker and punch you i mean you know in the uh in the arm or in the stomach or something and by the way that didn't tickle but we laughed about it you know cuz that's that's boy stuff to do and uh once right after we had the uh, varsity club follies which uh, I wrote was the first uh, thing I wrote. Which that's right. It was uh, also called Dorothy takes a trip. How do you like that? And uh, I played Dorothy, <laughs> and I got uh, a dress from my sister. It was one of those uh, like thigh high dresses, and uh, and a wig from my mom. She had a wig in the attic somewhere, and it was like a white wig. <laughs> well. Folks, this was this was the Varsity Club Follies, but uh, he, uh, Mr. May, asked the next day because he was there because all the sports guys were there and all the students were there, and uh, 
He asked in class. He said to me, uh, "Miller, that was good last night. Good work, and it was uh, it was fun. And uh, where'd you get that wig?" And uh, <laughs> and I said, "From my mom." And uh, he said, "Oh yeah, is your mother bald?" And I said, "Every night." And <laughs> that was I didn't think about saying that. Well, I, I'm not going to defend. I just said it, and everyone laughed including Mr. May, and he just motioned me with the crook the finger. Let's go outside into the hallway there. And I, and I went. It was, it was great. Everyone was laughing. And he got me in the hallway there, and he, he slammed me up against one of the lockers. and But he didn't hit me because this time he was still laughing so hard. He said, oh, that was a good one, Miller. I got to hand it to you. <laughs> and so he... And I laughed for another couple of seconds there, and he said, okay, come on, let's go back. So we went back into class. But I, I remember that. He was a great guy, Mr. May. And uh, in any case, Mike, you take care of the big talk about life, the birds and the bees. I don't even know what that means, by the way. I never knew. The birds and the bees? You know, let's, let's have that talk about the birds and the bees. What? Don't get stung? What? What's the basis of that talk? I still don't even know. I I I I know something about sex. I have kids, but well, in any case, Mike, uh, that's your job. And I want to mention, uh, you know, we put in Donna Reed today for the dancers, and uh, it's also because she was in the movie coming up that I have for the magic movie moment. And boy, God bless her, she was gorgeous and a great actress. And uh, I didn't even know. Her movie work was so good because I just got to know her from the Donna Reed show on TV. And uh, that was a good show, too. And I think back now, because she's so beautiful, thinking back to, wow, the husband in the TV show must have, you know, been really happy. He had it great because he had Donna Reed as a wife. But, of course, again, that's not knowing anything about TV at that point where, well, they're not making out, Larry. You know, they're not... They're not getting a motel room just before taping. In any case, Donna Reed is great. And it's worth pointing out, I wanted to mention Michael Jim Delegati. And I know I've mentioned this before, but I like obituaries. That's, there's nothing creepy about that. I think it's wonderful to get a good story about someone. It's like a little biography. And when they're well-written and when the person... Well, had a great life, you know. So I just want to read you, first of all, the, the, just the first paragraph of this. Uh, you probably didn't know his name, but you've almost certainly devoured his creation. And, the, and then they describe the creation, which is two all-beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. You probably knew that as well as I did, and that was invented by Michael James, quote, Jim Delegati, and he was a McDonald's franchisee, he owned a franchise, who created the Big Mac nearly 50 years ago and uh, saw it become, well, you know, the, the best known fast food wonder in the world, and he uh, died at home in Pittsburgh a couple of days ago and was 98 years old. And his son, one of his sons said that uh, uh, he ate at least one Big Mac a week for decades. His dad did. And uh, that also shows you that says something good about McDonald's, but that, yeah, they, don't, they won't kill you. You know, you, you may not look like David Bowie, but I mean, it's, it's not going to kill you. And uh, I just think that this guy was neat, folks. I read this thing. He was His franchise was based, it says here, in Uniontown, not far from Pittsburgh, where he invented the chain's signature burger in 1967 after deciding, by the way, see, he listened to his customers. He said, it says, after deciding his customers wanted a bigger sandwich because McDonald's at that point in 1967 was, uh, it was good stuff, but they had, well, hamburgers and uh, cheeseburgers and fries and uh, shakes. 
And they, those burgers weren't, you know, weren't big. And the customers told him, you know, we want something bigger. We want a bigger sandwich. Well, to fill up on. And uh, he was, I love this. One of his sons said he was often asked why he named it the Big Mac. And he said because Big Mick sounded too funny. And he wasn't trying to be funny there, by the way. It's just true. If you do just MC, well, the big, the big Mick, it, it doesn't, it doesn't somehow work. But Big Mac, well, is perfect. And, uh, boy, oh boy, this guy, and, and, and I love what it just says over here, by the way. It, 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 it just mentions, oh, we're just looking down. Oh yeah. And then he put it into, he put the Big Mac, uh, McDonald's wasn't crazy about it to start with. They thought, you know, why do we want to change our menu now? It's doing really well. But he put it into all of his, get this, all of his 47 restaurants in Pennsylvania. So he had, he had 47 McDonald's, McDonald's. There were, you know, all those golden arches and they were his. And that's, so this is another one of those obituaries where you look at that picture and he's smiling and you think, you know what? Get a load of you. Good for you. And that's the way I felt. I had a big smile on my face, you know, that, uh, whew. oh, and then, then McDonald's said, by the way, about, uh, <laughs> love they say this here, when the burger turned 40, which would be 10 years ago, McDonald's estimated it was selling 550 million Big Macs a year, or roughly... 17 every second. Well, that's, that's pretty good. That's a lot of, uh, that's a lot of Big Macs. And, uh, whew, good for this guy. And plus, in addition to that, he co-founded Pittsburgh's Ronald McDonald House, which is then the, that's the seventh facility in the whole country they had. And that's where families can stay, as I'm sure you know, when, their children travel for medical care, and he was involved in many, many charities too, as as well, just you know, just like that. Plus, he invented also the breakfast service at McDonald's and he, developing the well, you know, hotcakes and sausage meal to feed hungry steel workers on their way home from overnight shifts. And it's another one of those get a load of this guy. That's just smart. Would you do that? Would I do that? Well, I I kind of hope so. I mean, would we get ideas like that? So, boy, oh boy, he's got a nice smile in this picture here, and he just, whew, oh, well, Michael Jim Delegati. Good for you. God bless you. Rest in peace. And uh, God bless your family as well. I hope they keep remembering great stories about you. In any case, uh, that's why I like obituaries sometimes. I hope you, you think about that too. Start start reading them because you know what? Sometimes they make you feel really good. And by Amazon and PayPal and the Larry Miller Store. Boy, that's a that's a good mouthful to say. Amazon, as you know, is uh well one of still my favorite company in the world, they do three things no one else does. One, they give you whatever you want. Whatever you order, they'll just send it to you. Anything. It can be anything in the world. Two, they already have it. They don't have to order it. They don't have to make it. They don't have to borrow it. They, they, they have one. They have a thousand of them right there. Whatever you want. Whatever you can imagine. And, uh, and they've got one of those big Indiana Jones warehouses that's a mile long and a mile wide and a mile high and a mile deep. So whatever you can order, even if it's big, they've got it. And three, this is the best part, they send us a percentage of whatever it is you order. And that's pretty great. That uh, So you order something uh, from Amazon we get a percentage here on the show to the Larry Miller Show, and it's cash, and they send it to us, and we put it right in the big steel box where we're saving money for our next big fancy fried chicken dinner with two drinks beforehand in a different place. 
That's right, there are very strict rules. In fact, Colonel Jeff and I have been talking about that recently, just a bit, about where we might go for the next big fancy fried chicken dinner with two drinks beforehand in a different place. And we haven't come up with anything yet, but we will. And uh, there's some good places here on Milleronia, by the way. But, well, Colonel Jeff knows this. Just between, well, you know, entre nous, if you don't tip enough, you're risking a stroll up to the volcanoes. So I want to let you that. Well, I'll let you know that beforehand. And by the way, if you're going to go to Milleronia, number one, we have to know it because don't just let anybody come in the big gate. We got that gate, by the way, from the old King Kong movies, the, the first ones. That really giant gate with logs that you slide across to lock the thing. In any case, uh, go to Amazon and go to, if you want to go there, by the way, come to our website. You could go to Amazon yourself. You could go, you know, and just go on there with your laptop or your iPhone or something, but don't do that. What you want to do, go to our website first, LarryMillerPodcast.com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. Ooh, excuse me. I should have had the fish. But, <laughs> oh, do that, though. Go to our website because we have a banner that says Amazon. And you click our banner. Then go take a nap on your easy chair. And don't worry about it. Colonel Jeff and I will get you to Amazon. That red life light goes off on our phones. And we'll get together at the nearest studio here on Milleronia or back on the mainland. And by the way, you know what? There's another light there for PayPal. What a good group they are. You know what? If you work with PayPal, they'll make you feel like you're saving the world. And who knows? Maybe you are. But if you enjoy my show, and why wouldn't you? And you'd like to send a few bucks here to help out, and why wouldn't you? You can do it through PayPal. So, you know, this is just what I like to do. Instead of saying, I don't say donate or pay what you like or join the Platinum Committee. I always say, just buy us some drinks. That's right, because there are different levels, levels one through five, all the way up to, we're driving to Florida! <laughs> Boy, that sounds like... The applause after a sex ed class taught by Mr. May. We were, well, we were just agog at the things he knew. And uh, at any rate, by the way, go to PayPal the same way. Don't go on your own. We have a PayPal banner on our website. Remember, that's LarryMillerPodcast.com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. <laughs> I don't know why that reminded me of one of those old black and white things where the guy's on ice skates, but he had a he put a jet engine on his back to go really fast on the skates, I guess. But the jet engine, and they're small. They weren't. It wasn't a giant, you know, torpedo-sized jet engine. These were small, and they caught fire. And when they caught fire, he caught fire. You must have seen that on TV at some point. And naturally, he's the skates go whoa 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 whoa. He's going whoa whoa whoa, and he's sort of slapping himself in the back to put out the fire. You know, as the cameraman hasn't moved from the camera, he's just still filming the thing. You could have said he could have said, Bill, would you please come over here and put out my butt is on fire? Would you please put it out? But in any case, do that. Go to PayPal. And we thank you because every little bit helps us keep the old leg lamp lit. And thank you to everyone who's contributed already or is thinking of doing it right now. And by the Larry Miller Show Store. That's right. I'm so pleased about this. And Colonel Jeff and I are both happy about it. The Larry Miller Show Store is now open for business. And it features three soon-to-be classic T-shirt designs. How soon? I don't know. But soon. Isn't that good enough for you? It, sh it should be. And uh, I, I love these items, though. There's the Larry Miller Drinking Society shirt featuring the famous LMDS logo. 
And our semi-secret slogan, Nominum Quid Geminus, which means, you call that a double? Something you've probably wanted to say to bartenders from time to time over the years. And uh, the first idea, I wanted to get that in Latin. So we did that. Colonel Jeff and I found out, well, how do you say that in Latin? How do you say you call that a double in Latin? And we got several ideas that were terrific when we chose nominum quid geminus, because they, apparently in Latin they didn't have an, a great need for asking the bartender why he didn't give them enough when they ordered it, because the chances are at that point, well, the bartender would wind up being nailed to something that could start a religion. And you, you didn't want to, you didn't want to annoy the Romans. Another group that wasn't kidding around. Every time someone said, Hey, look, everyone, it's the USC marching band coming over the hill. No, no, it's not. It's the very neatly marching Romans. And they're not joking. And uh, you know what, though? And here's a, here's a brand new t uh, shirt that I just love for us Keep Calm and Larry On shirt. And. Uh, well, as Jeff and I like to say, it's not just a mantra for life. It's the motto sensation that's sweeping the nation. I still like the, the sound of that. I think soon, or in another few weeks or a couple of months, I think we'll both say, maybe we've, maybe we've had it with that <laughs> sweeping the nation. And finally, show how tough you are, and I know you do, with the brand new... I survived Volcano Number 2, and all I got was this lousy T-shirt. Shirt. And all these shirts, by the way, are printed on demand, so you can choose from a variety of colors. And, best news of all, they're available in both gentlemen's and ladies' cut T-shirts. I'm not sure that's the best news of all, but it's certainly good news. And it always makes me smile that, uh, well, the, the only time you see the word gentleman, it seems, anymore is on the billboards in, uh, well, that part of town where they have bail bondsmen and strip clubs. And they always say, it's a gentleman's club. Come on into the to the gentleman's club. By the way, nothing wrong with that. I, it's been a long time, been over 20 years since I've been in a joint like that. But that's just because I could... Uh, I, cu I couldn't figure out what to do in a strip club. I, I seriously couldn't. I didn't know where I was supposed to look. They were really pretty girls, and they were, well, they were healthy, as my dad would say. God bless her, healthy kid. But you know what? Uh, I didn't know where to look. And it's, do I smile at someone? Because I would be embarrassed if I looked at other places on her and then, you know, looked up and she was looking at me. And I wasn't looking at her. In any case, I, maybe she would have liked it if I got, got her one of these T-shirts. In any case, folks, uh, they, they're available in all sizes, all colors. Go to LarryMillerShow.com slash store. And so, well, I'm awfully glad they're there. We're going to keep expanding. We're going to have all sorts of products coming on. But that's a good step for us. And it makes me happy to have. So... Thank you in advance, folks. And that brings me to my favorite part of the show, the joke of the week. Boy, <laughs> yeah, the joke of the week is, is my favorite part of the show. There's nothing better, nothing makes you feel better than passing on a good joke. And if it's good enough, maybe your family and friends will pass it on themselves. Colonel Jeff and I both liked this one. Uh, a woman walks into Walmart with her two little kids. And she didn't even get dressed. She has kind of pajama pants on and flip-flops. And she's, well, dirty and has tattoos and not good tattoos, you know. And not even as good as prison tattoos. These were done in a prison, but not by someone she liked. In any case, I mean, you know, she's, and she's yelling at these kids wherever they go. She's like, ah, and she's got a, she's got a voice just like sandpaper, just, and she's, 
screaming, get out of my head, and, and cursing, and, and just really a, well, she's in bad shape. She's a, a sad-looking sort. And uh, the the greeter comes up to say hello. The greeter at Walmart and the uh, the elderly man who has a nice smile on his face and comes up to her and just says, uh, well, hello, ma'am. Uh, welcome to the store. I hope you have uh, find a good time today and everything you wanted. And uh, the children look wonderful. Uh, are those twins? And she says, well, I mean, twins are not twins. Uh, two, two years apart and I guess uh, they don't look anything like each other. And the, and, and the greedy says to her, oh, well, uh, I just couldn't imagine someone having sex with you twice. <laughs> we like that that one thought it was pretty good that's right even even folks well who just get out of prison if they saw her they'd say can i go back into prison before do i have to do this is that part of the parole but that was a pretty good one and if you like that please pass it along to well as, as i say a family or a friend and that leads me to my second favorite part of the show, The Poetry Corner. <laughs> Boy, that string quartet makes the day even prettier. This is a this is a terrific poem. It's called the Glory of Age by Edgar Albert Guest. Edgar Albert Guest was an English poet who moved to the U.S. with his family when he was a kid. He lived from 1881 to 1959. He was very popular in the first half of the 20th century. He was known as the People's Poet. And get this, he wrote 11,000 poems that were syndicated in 300 newspapers, but 11,000 poems, folks. That was a tough week. No, I mean, this, is, this, guy was, this guy was good. He was prolific. And here's his poem called The Glory of Age. What is the glory of age, I said, a hoard of gold and a few dear friends? When you've reached the day that you look ahead and see the place where your journey ends, when time has robbed you of youthful might, what is the secret of your delight? And an old man smiled as he answered me, The glory of age isn't gold or friends when we've reached the valley of soon-to-be. And note the place where our journey ends. The glory of age, be it understood, is a boy out there who is making good. The greatest joy that can come to man when his sight is dim and his hair is gray. The greatest glory that God can plan to cheer the lives of the old today. When they share no more in the battle yell, is a boy out there who is doing well. Isn't that nice? How do you like that? Any time through the lives, and especially even calling, I love that at the end. Well, even when they share no more in the battle yell, they're not, if, if, if it's an old man, well, you know what? That old man is still a boy out there who is doing well. He made it. He got to the older part of his life. Well, I think that's a terrific poem, and Colonel Jeff does too, by Edgar Albert Guest. And I'm glad you folks heard it. I'm glad I had a chance to give it to you. Once again, if you like it, please pass it on. And that brings me to my third favorite part of the show. M. 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 Triple M. The Magic Movie Moment. Boy, and that piano note I love at the end there. You almost want to. Oof. Oh, excuse me. I shouldn't have. I'm so sorry. 
In any case, uh, this is a terrific movie, folks. I hope you know it well. From Here to Eternity, the great, based on the great James Jones novel, it's from 1953, directed by Fred Zinneman, starring Burt Lancaster, Deborah Carr, Ernest Borgnine, Frank Sinatra, Montgomery Clift, Donna Reed, Claude Aikens, George Reeves, Jack Warden, and so many others. It's a great look at an army base on Hawaii just before Pearl Harbor. And, well, you know what? There's there's many, many magical scenes in this and all oh, the characters and the way they're made and, oh, the the anger and the fights between Frank Sinatra and Ernest Borgnine. Ernest Borgnine, the great Borgnine, such a good actor. And he played Fatso Judson in this. And boy, he wasn't someone to mess with. And that's why Frank Sinatra messed with him as Maggio. But folks, there's a great a great scene. It's almost it's almost classic, really, from this great movie, From Here to Eternity. Burt Lancaster who plays the sergeant, an assistant in his commanding officer's offices there, and Deborah Carr, who is the commanding officer's wife. This is a, well, this is a tough movie. And made, made in, well, 1953, this is really wild behavior. And, well, Burt Lancaster and Deborah Carr like each other, and they start to go out. And they wind up, I won't tell you how or why, but they wind up making out on the beach together at midnight. And they, well, they're in, you know, the bathing bathing suits and they're rolling in the sand there and the water comes up and laps around them. And boy, oh boy, that scene really got people thinking because that was pretty wild, pretty wild behavior for the time. And by the way, it's it's just so funny as as astonishing as that was, and how important it was. And Deborah Carr said after making that scene and after the movie became a big hit, Deborah Carr said, "You know, no one ever thought I was a good actress until they saw me in a bathing suit," and, which is a pretty good line. And you know what, though, to be honest, as a kid or even an adolescent or an adult, even the scene quite never got to me the way it got to other people because all I could think of was I hate when sand gets all over me. I I just couldn't understand why. Is that relaxing? Is that the kind of a relaxing kissing when you're rolling in the sand and the sand gets well in your bathing trunks and you know all over and maybe in in your hair and your in one of your ears or something? I just all I could think of was ooh I don't want can can Deborah and I just go to a a hotel or a motel? Can we do that? I mean, I don't need that to be romantic, but boy, folks, that scene was very romantic, and it was really stunning to people. And oh, I'll bet you, Dollar, it was stunning to Bert and Deborah as well. It's a great movie, From Here to Eternity. If you haven't seen it, please do. Wow, what a cast! And directed so well, and what story it tells before Pearl Harbor on Hawaii. Well, Colonel Jeff and I were talking about they were trying to relax on the beach like that, but we didn't even know if we could relax. We, we you know, Colonel Jeff was saying, Well, I've been working so much, and I really wanted to just take some time off, take it easy, even just a couple of days. I mean, even just two days. And he and I are the same on lots of things, and uh, I think uh, you folks and I are the same on lots of things, too. But one of them is I don't quite know how to take it easy. I don't never quite knew how to take time off. I don't even know what the phrase is, time off. What does that even mean? And Colonel Jeff and I both agreed, if you ever do that, sometimes even just for an afternoon, where you finish your work, it's about 12 or 1 or something, and you say to yourself, well, let's see, the kids are coming home from school. I pick them up at four or something like that. And that gives you three hours. And you might think, I might think, I have thought, you know, uh, 
Well, why don't I take it easy? Why don't I take the time off? Take it easy. Sure, you can, you know what? Take off your topsiders and get into your own bed. You don't have to get under the covers, but lay yourself down there. Maybe make a bowl of fruit or some lunch or something and turn the TV on and take a nap for 25 minutes. But you know what? I don't think that's the kind of people we are. And I like it this way. I like it my way. I like it Colonel Jeff's way. And I think I like it your way, too. You know what? If you ever take it easy, the first thing you're going to be thinking is, why am I taking it easy? Shouldn't I be worrying about something? Shouldn't I be planning something? Shouldn't I be doing something? Well, I'll take it that way, and no complaints, folks. And, in fact, we had a garage door man here just uh, before just before Colonel Jeff got here for the show. And it happens whether it's on Milleronia or back on the mainland. You know what? We, on, on Saturday night, and uh, that this was back on the mainland, where I live in Southern California. And you know what? We had a blackout. We had a, a real blackout. And not not over the whole city, but uh, well down on the in the business area, the valley there, every the lights were on and people were fine. But boy, oh boy, there's really nothing before it was dark out too. There's nothing like those lights going out and everything went out. The fridge goes off, you know. There's no no lights, no air conditioning, no stove, no. Well, nothing. And you know what? We, uh, my wife and I, as we, we, we had a dinner date planned here with two of our friends and another couple, and that was supposed to be at 6.30. The lights went out at 4.15, 4.13 to be exact. And, well, we, my wife was very smart. She got three flashlights in a pack from Costco. And boy, these cast quite a beam. And so she gave uh, one to one of my kids, and she gave one to me, and she kept one. And so we went around and just checking things, make sure switches were off. And uh, when I said to uh, my son there, who was going to stay home, because uh, he went and wanted to get himself something to eat, he wanted to get uh, go to a burger place, In and Out. That's right, he wanted to go to In and Out, and that's fine. But so when he came back, I said, you know. We'll give you a call. We're going to leave here because we're getting together at 6.30. And then the lights came back on, by the way, at 5 to 6. But still, I said, you know, we'll give you a call. Make sure everything's okay. Don't, uh, you know, the whole, if the things go out again, let them go out. Don't worry about anything. Don't do anything elaborate. If you want to go down the stairs, well, just go down slowly. Don't go skipping down the stairs. I don't know about you. That's typical father stuff for me. And then I, you know, I told him about the birds and the bees again. But no, I didn't, But because <laughs> I still didn't know. But in any case, you know what? We opened one of the garage doors by hand. There are two garage doors we have, and they're both electric. They're both automatic. But we opened, uh, they wouldn't work because the electricity was off. So we opened one by hand and, well, got it down again. My wife and I... Uh, my wife moved her car out into the driveway, and then I closed the garage door from the inside and uh, with my son, and then we shook hands and hugged. I said, all right, I love you. I'll speak to you from the restaurant there. And then I went out one of the back doors and left that open just in case we needed a door that was open. The point is, though, we couldn't get the garage door back up again or down again and we called the garage door man, and he came this morning. They needed a few days because, uh, well, because the blackout, they had a lot of things like garage doors that went out on people. And you know what, folks? It was another nice moment in life where things just go well. I knew the garage door man. His name is Spencer, and we've met before. He's been here several times. And he came before Colonel Jeff got here. And you know what? He fixed it maybe two seconds or three seconds. There was just one thing to do to that along the track there where the door runs. And he did it. He, he said, well, let me just try this. And it, he kind of jerked it back. And it 
and it clicked into place. He said, I think that's it. And sure enough, it was. And the door just worked again. And he said, you know what? And the door came down. He said, he looked at it. He said, you know what? As long as I'm here, because all of the nuts and bolts and screws on the door and on the frame were loose. And I mean, almost a quarter inch out. He said, let me, let me screw these all back in nice and tight. And he did that and greased it all. And oh boy, he did everything to that frame and those doors. And it's a nice feeling, folks, to know, how do you like that? That part of our lives is okay now. now I don't know what else is, is going to, well, go screwy, but that part is okay. And I liked him and I paid him. Colonel Jeff got there then. And, uh, well, our two dogs just wanted to say hello, too. They always want to say hello. But it was nice when you shake hands with someone and give him a check and say thank you, and he smiles and you smile. You know what? I hope you have things that happen like a good visit by a garage doorman, because when it does happen that way, you feel terrific. And I said hi to Colonel Jeff. And we went upstairs to make a cup of coffee the way we always do. And the dogs came with us the way they always do. And you know what? It's just starting the day right. You feel healthier. You feel more fit. You think, hey, everything's coming up roses. And uh, also on this day, that's a good way to feel because there was a reason that, uh, well... I wanted to add something about Donna Reed because she's not only, God bless her, a great actress, but she was in a great movie. And that's why I was so happy to mention Donna Reed in the opening. And that's why I was so happy to mention, well, in the magic movie moment, the movie From Here to Eternity. And she was in that too. Oh, she was great. What a cast was in that. Because today, folks, is Pearl Harbor Day. Today, December 7th, 1941, was the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. And we had 2,400 soldiers and civilians killed in their attack, plus 1,000 wounded in their attack. And you know what the truth is? When, well, when President Roosevelt said that famous line, on December 8th, after Pearl Harbor, when he said, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. And I don't think it does anymore to too many of us. I think, well, it's something else most people just pass over. But I think it's good to not pass over it so quickly. Today is the 75th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. A lot of men and women and children killed in that raid, that, that sneak attack. And if you notice, I'm using phrases that aren't even that popular anymore. Well, that we, you know, because we all live in a time of, well, they're just doing this. Well, all people do this. Oh, they're just fighting for this or that. No, not to me. And you know what? I don't like looking at the pictures of there was a, something on the internet about Pearl Harbor. And, well, about a, a third or a half of their pictures, of their photos, were of the Japanese planes and the Japanese bombing us and the Japanese taking off from their aircraft carriers. And there's one they said of the Japanese cheering as another attack wave takes off. And I, I can't look at that. I don't look at that. I pass those photos by. Because you know what? They still make me mad. And it's it's like me always. I'll buy anything with the World Trade Center on it. I, 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 I don't know if that sounds crazy. But if I'm in New York and there's a street salesman there with photos of this or they're in frames, you know, $5, $10 for a colored photo. There's one in our hallway back on the mainland. Colonel Jeff knows it, and it has the World Trade Center in it, still standing. And I buy those, because I still hate the people who do did it. You know, I, I, I'm not, by nature, I'm not one who says that, uh, well, we're all the same, and they're 
They're just fighting to... No, no, they're not. And you know what? It's something to remember that on a... Well, on December 7th, on the 75th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor with the USS Oklahoma and the Arizona and the West Virginia and so many other ships. It was just lucky, very, very lucky for us that none of our aircraft carriers were in the port at that time because, well, we needed them and they would they were too hard to build from scratch in just a few months. And I'm sorry to say, we don't take it seriously anymore. To see the photos of our men, Navy men, racing out in boats to try and find the trapped and wounded in the harbor there during the attack, while it's still going on. Because, you know, as Colonel Jeff pointed out, there aren't many surviving vets anymore. No, they're not, folks. There aren't that many. Because in those days, remember, this, if this was 1941... Good Lord, that's 75 years ago right there. And those vets weren't all 18 or 19. You know, they were in their 20s and 30s and 40s and more at all level of ranks. And you know what? No, there there are fewer and fewer of them left. And soon it's just going to be pictures in a book or something on the Internet that no one really takes to heart. Well, let's do that, because I remember when I was a kid, and Colonel Jeff remembered too, there, you know, there were still Civil War veterans alive and well. They were very old, but I remember, you know, you'd see a picture in Life magazine or something of two vets, one from the Union and one from the Confederacy, and they were, good Lord, they were a hundred years old or, or older than older than that. And they'd be across on one of the borders on the Mason-Dixon line, shaking hands. And, whew, well, they're not around anymore, folks. And, uh, you know, I think you feel a bond with a war when you can still see the men who fought it. And, well, World War II veterans are getting less and less by the day. You know that. Soon, again, it'll just be pictures. So... I thought, well, next time we got to Hawaii, me and the family, well, we don't have any plans to do something like that. And uh, But the next time, I'm going to make sure we go to the Pearl Harbor Memorial, where the Arizona is still buried underwater there, by the way, and all the men with her. And you and I, well, we know the same things. Homer is Homer. And Pluto is a planet. And so remember, as always, if you walked out of bed today and had a job to go to and a home to come back to and someone there who cares about you, folks, the game's over and you've won. Be well. Have a good December 7th. And we'll see you here next time.